Let's confess the faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let us greet one another. We can only forgive the sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Today's message is titled, Wisdom to Live the Last Hour. On the first of this month, a new law came into effect in Germany. That is a self-determination act. This law allows individuals to change their registered gender without requiring, requiring court approval. In April, the German government created this new law after criticism that the previous gender reassignment law, which required psychological evaluations and court decisions, infringed on LGBTQ plus rights. Now, an individual can change their gender simply by notifying the registry office and choosing from options such as male, female, diverse, or no designation. So you may say, today I'll be male, and maybe tonight you might say, I don't want to be male anymore. And then tomorrow you can go to the office and you can change your gender. The law permits individuals to register as a different gender, multiple genders, or even remove their gender designation entirely, regardless of whether they have undergone gender reassignment surgery. While this law might seem straightforward, it raises potential issues for gender segregated spaces like prisons, locker rooms, and restrooms. Even in the United States, their dormitory, there's no se separate parts for male and female. They all sleep together. There's four beds in their room, and they all sleep together in the same room. And some worry that men could misuse the lo new law to access women-only spaces. So there's no, no one who will block them, stop them. In the sports world, even more surprising scenarios could arise. And there is a scenario in Paris Olympics. So there was significant debate, debate over the issue during the recent Paris Olymp Olympics. This male sports star, he changed his gender and he won the gold medal as a female, female sports um, athlete. However, Germany was not the first country to enact such a law. Although it might be hard to imagine, many other European countries already have similar laws in place. In fact, beyond Germany, over 20 countries in Europe, including Spain, Sweden, Denmark, Ireland, Belgium, Luxembourg, Portugal, Switzerland, and Scotland, are part of this broader trend. And this trend isn't likely to remain within Europe. It's a matter of time before it flows into Asia. For many, this may be the first time hearing about the Self-Determination Act. How would you react upon hearing about this law? Likely with something like, this must be the end times. These are indeed unusual complex laws that are emerging and coming into effect. What's more concerning is the impact this could have on future generations who are now facing crisis. In the United States, 
issues surrounding gender identity among youth are becoming serious and it shakes society. In California and some other states, minors can undergo gender reassignment surgery without parental consent. Last year, 3.3% of American teens identified as transgender, which is more than double the percentage from the previous year. Over the past 10 years, the number of youth identifying as transgender has risen sharply in the U.S. Among high school students, one in four now identifies as part of the LGBTQ plus community. One in the four, they say that they belong in the LGBTQ plus community. These students who identify as transgender experience higher rates of depression, despair, and suicidal ideation compared to their peers. I use the example of the United States because this trend will also reach Korea. Korean society, too, could face a similar crisis. If we aren't spiritually awake, and if we don't, as today's message tells, possess wisdom to live the last hour, we risk being swept away by the currents of the world. In today's passage, the Apostle John realistically advises us on the phenomena of the last days and how we should spiritually respond. I, be I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to transcend worldly trends and spread the good influence of the gospel with the wisdom to live in the last hour. Point number one, a life rooted in the truth. Verse 18 reads, Children, it is a last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is a last hour. With a fatherly heart, the Apostle John offers guidance to believers with fragile faith, defining what he calls the last hour. It is the last hour. We often speak of the end times, but the concept of the last days can feel vague and uncertain. People said that it was the end 2,000 years ago, and it's still the end times now. Sometimes it's phrased as the very end of the end times, meaning the end within the end. Yet even this lacks clarity. It seems urgent, but it's difficult to grasp in our human sense of time. So according to the Bible, what defines the last days? The Bible describes the period between Jesus Christ's first coming and his second coming as the last days, a time foretold and foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, we do not know precisely when Jesus will return. He will absolutely come, but we do not know when he will come. In Matthew 24, 36, Jesus tells us, But concerning that day, an hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus himself says he doesn't know. So what are we to do? Jesus gives us a clear answer in verse 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what on what day your Lord is coming. 
And again in verse 44, Therefore you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. In short, we must remain spiritually awake and prepared to welcome Jesus whenever He comes. So always, every day, you must be prepared. You must be prepared. So I said this one one time on a Friday service. I said maybe Jesus will come on a Friday night service. We must remember that any attempt to pinpoint a specific time or create a sense of urgency by predicting dates is unbiblical. So if you talk about the end times, specific times, you're a con. So you don't know when Jesus will come. And if you say you know the dates, that's a lie. So what we must do is we must stay awake. Date-setting predictions for the end times are nothing but deception. So we must stay awake. Unfortunately, through Jesus and his direct disciples, we can know about various spiritual phenomena that will occur in the end times. In our text, the Apostle John also mentions this. It is a last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. The rise of the Antichrist marks the end of the age. The direct term Antichrist only appears four times in John's epistle. But it's a concept pervasive in the Old Testament and one of the major themes of eschatology. The Antichrist is called Antichristos in Greek, where anti means opposite. Therefore, the word Antichrist means one who opposes Christ, one who stands in Christ's place. Jesus already says this in Matthew 24, 5, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Jesus said he will come again, so there may be a lot of people who will say, who will claim that they are the Christ. And there are so many now. There are so many antichrists in our country. There are so many people who claim themselves as Christ. The Apostle Paul also mentions the existence of antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 4.4. 4 who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. In other words, the Antichrist is a force that opposes Christ, a spirit that usurps, usurps the authority and glory, glory of God. And they must have that spirit, that power, and for people to follow them. Because the evil spirit works upon them, they have power and people follow them. So look at JMS. He didn't even go to the elementary school. But then in that organization, there are so many elites from Seoul National University. So you can even see that he's so ignorant, but then there are so many people, so many elites who follow them. And according to Revelation 19 and 20, the Antichrist will be destroyed at Christ's return and will be cast into hell forever. But the problem is that this Antichrist is temporarily active right now. They're active right now. And how are they active? John defines the Antichrist in verse 22 as someone who lies and deceives and denies that Jesus is the Christ. 
The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he said that in the verse. Verse 22 reads, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So our elders always pray that Jesus is the Christ. And we all confess that Jesus is the Christ. And if you say that confession, you are not Antichrist. So do not be afraid. Jesus, you are my Christ. And that person is doing the walk of faith, biblical walk of faith. Even if you have bad temper, even if you have bad manners, if you confess that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is my Christ, then you are the children of God. You're not a weird person. You're not a spiritually weird person. There is a reason John refers to the Antichrist in this way. At that time, Gnostics, influenced by the Greek dualistic philosophy that only the spiritual is good and the physical is evil, were entering the church and deceiving the saints by denying that Jesus had come in the flesh. So it may seem true, they say, spirit is good and physical is evil. So they say, spiritual is good and the physical is evil. But behind that, there is a trick behind it. When you think about it, Jesus had come in the flesh. He came 100% in flesh. So it's them denying that Jesus had come in the flesh. So if Jesus didn't come in flesh, how could he save our save us from the sin? That's why people who that's why Gnostics they don't have any salvation. So they say it's nonsense that Jesus came, God himself came in flesh. That's evil. In other words, they denied Jesus' humanity. Verse 19 reads, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, and that it might become plain that they, are, they all are not of us. Fortunately, these Antichrist Gnostics false teachers are now gone from inside the church. However, they still exist and are trying to destroy the church. So John emphasizes that we must respond with the proper spiritual discernment. He also mentions the core of spiritual response, verses 24 to 25. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is a promise that He made to us eternal life. In short, we must be rooted in the spiritual truth spiritual truth. What you heard from the beginning in the scripture signifies the truth that Jesus taught and the truth of the gospel that John the Apostle and the Apostles taught. The core is the truth that Jesus, who was incarnated, incarnated is Christ, the Son of God. We can only enjoy eternal life when we abide in the truth that Jesus is the Christ. So what's the truth? 
아 살아서 내가 물한 지역불에 떨어지는구나 그분 여기 다 열렸어요 보통 종이 아닙니다 보통 소리가 아니에요 내가 살아서 물한 지역불에 And the Buddhist monk He claims that He's always um, thinking about the truth. So how can we be set free if, if we do not know the truth? You must know the truth. I am the way, the truth. The Son of God, Jesus, becoming my Christ is the truth. So you must have this confession every day. Jesus, you are my Christ. That is the truth and that is the greatest confession. You must abide in the truth for you to have the eternal life. Eternal life. Most people in the field now do not know that Jesus is Christ. Even the scriptures tells, scripture tells us. Are we just making up these words? There are people who do not know Christ outside. The non-believers, they do not know that Jesus is the Christ. The religious people, they do not know that. And even the churchgoers, they don't know this. I didn't know this before. I was a pastor, but I did not know this. And I was born as Christian, but I did not know this. I never missed a single week of church, but I did not know this. The, fa the fact that Jesus is the Christ, I did not know this. I did not have the resolution and conclusion that Jesus is the Christ. And those who didn't, didn't, who didn't come to conclusion, they still have so many crises and conflicts. And they're always shaken. May all of you confess that Jesus is the Christ from today on and do not be shaken. And this is such an amazing fact and that is why Satan tries his best to not let you realize. So ask them, ask the churchgoers to explain to you who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. How can they confess when they do not even know why Jesus is Christ? That is why your role is important as you are rooted in the true, true truth. The reason that we're carrying out the ministry to enlarge the place of the tent of the church region to 37 nations and the family and rel relatives. Evangelism is in it too. So why are we sending the missionaries? Why are we evangelizing? Why are we devoting? That is to tell that Jesus is the Christ. That is why every time we give worship, we confess our faith. And we confess the Apostles' Creed, and we also have other confession. So we confess the Apostles' Creed, and we also confess that Jesus is the Christ. I bless all Yewon members in the name of the Lord to be the absolute disciples of Christ who spread the spiritual truth that Jesus is Christ with joy and gratitude in the field of life. Point number two, a life that abides in the Lord. Verses 26 to 27. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie just as it has taught you abide in him who are trying to deceive you in the scripture is the Gnostics 
who deceives saints with false truth and shakes the unity of the church, not the truth of the gospel. The false teachers did not believe in the incarnation of Jesus or his resurrection and everything. So John the Apostle so whoever who believes that Jesus is the Christ will not harm the church. So John the Apostle emphasized spiritual arm armament to the saints. The key is to fully believe what we hear from the beginning and live a life abiding by the Lord. What you heard from the beginning means the word of God, the true truth of the gospel. We must stand firm on the truth of the gospel. As a timetable now, it means to become one with the flow of the public message. Be one with the public message. So are you not able to listen to the word? That's Satan's prank. So this is the word of God and you can't hear it? You're being deceived. Out of many churches being called specifically to Yewon Church. There's so many churches in this council region. Why did he send me? Why did he send me to Yewon Church? That means that you are meant to live out your walk of faith in the flow of the Yewon pulpit. Therefore, God has led you here. That is why following the pulpit's mes pulpit message and spiritual flow is natural, serving as a pathway to experiencing the answers God provides according to His time schedule. You have done well. You have done so well thus far, and I really want this Yewon Church to be the spiritual model before all the churches in Korea. So, in the Christianity, in Korea, in the Christianity organization in Korea. I am a co-leader. So they represent Korean churches. So I will be leading the prayer meeting before all the pastors who are in this organization. I hope you will continue to live a covenant-centered life constantly restoring spiritual vitality through the pulpit. In the main passage, the Apostle John speaks about a life abiding in the Lord, repeatedly using the term anointing. For Yeon Church members, mentioning anointing likely brings to mind Christ as Christ means the anointed one. So what does Christ mean, the anointed one? What does that mean? In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed to begin their ministries officially. So prophets, priests, and the king. So they must they had to be anointed for them to have this ministry. So the prophet is a way to meet God, is the person who restores the relationship between God and man, and priest that forgives all the sin, and the king, king crushed the Satan's power. 
the prophet, priest, and king who had absolute, absolute victory in the spiritual battle is the Christ. Therefore, declaring that Jesus is the Christ signifies that he fulfills the prophetic role of bringing us to God, the priestly role of forgiving all sins, and the kingly role of destroying the devil's work. As the Savior, Jesus the Christ perfectly resolved mankind's fundamental problems and opened the way to meet God. The moment we accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of our lives, all issues of the past, present, and future are resolved, and we receive eternal life. That is why we give Him our lives. We're promised to receive the eternal life. This is the gospel and the core of what we have heard from the beginning. Interesting, interestingly, the passage also describes us as those who have received an anointing. It says, but the anointing that you have received from him abides in you. And clarif uh, clarifies further in verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Here, receiving the anointing means the Holy Spirit has come upon us. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot confess that Jesus is the Christ. Without the Holy Spirit, people who are sitting here cannot understand this word. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, you will not be able to hear or understand the Word of God because there is no Holy Spirit. The moment we accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us and remains with us forever. Even if you made a little mistake, He will not leave you. So that you will know the tears of Jesus Christ. And He has chosen you and He has saved you and He will be with you until the day you go to heaven. Now the Holy Spirit actively guides in our lives in a realistic way. Verses 28 to 29. And now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at this coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. The Apostle John emphasizes that when the Holy Spirit makes us realize, we must live upon it. If you know the truth that Christ is righteous, you must move on to a life of righteousness and an unashamed act before Him on the day of the Lord will come again. What is the essence of this? It is to live a life that saves life. It is because God's righteousness is the salvation of souls through Jesus Christ. I bless our Yewon unity in the name of the Lord to become a unity that saves lives and stands as witnesses who fulfill God's righteousness. Now we proceed with the communion. What is communion? By taking the bread and drinking the wine, which symbolizes the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we commemorate the complete freedom we have received from all of the life's problems, especially the problem of sin, through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. It is also a time to reconfirm the great love of Jesus Christ. We have received a complete freedom. People make efforts to remember important things in various ways. They take photos or make videos to re remember, create mem commemorative plagues, or establish anniversaries to reconfirm the significance and refocus their lives. In our busy daily lives, we often forget the grace of redemption and forgiveness of sins. 
And how can we not forget this? We have so many problems and so many busy things to do. And we often forget the grace and the thanksgiving of redemption and forgiveness of sins. Therefore, we commemorate twice a year through communion to refocus our lives spiritually. The early church, every time they gathered, every week, they had communion. But then, if you do this every week, it may, ju it may just be the actions of it. That is why to commem commemorate twice a year through communion, refocus our lives spiritually, and you make a new spiritual decision. Apostle Paul explains the fundamental purpose of communion in 1 Corinthians 11:26. For as often you, as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Those who participate in communion are called to live in a way that proclaims Jesus Christ as the only path to forgiveness until the end of times. Only by accepting Jesus Christ and only by being in, the, in Jesus Christ. Those are end times. You don't know when the world will end. But proclaiming Jesus Christ until the end times I bless our I bless our Yewon unity in the name of the Lord to firmly hold on to the true meaning of communion, live wisely in these last days, and expand, enlarge the kingdom of God as his people. Let us proceed with the communion. The day before Jesus um, carrying his cross, he's, he knew that he would carry the cross. And his, he knew that he would shed his blood to save us. But then Jesus said, this should not end here. Those who eat my bread, eat my flesh, and who drinks my blood will receive eternal life. And you must commem commemorate this. And according to his command, we're going to eat the bread to commemorate his flesh, and we're going to commemorate his blood by drinking this wine. So we may have the full, complete restoration. So let us pray. Lord, as you have commanded, we're going to proceed with the communion. And the newly baptized will join us. And as we live in this world, there are so many times we forget the meaning of the communion. At this time, may we remember your flesh and your blood that you have shed. May we be renewed in Christ and may we be set free completely through this communion. We have our concerns and our problems and our issues and Satan is continuously attacking us but then we have st stood before you today and through communion may we restore everything and may you May the Holy Spirit guide us in this time of communion. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.